Welcome to episode 45 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Myla de Butterworth, and today we learn about the heritage of Beowulf and how he came to rescue of Hrothgar in the coming of Beowulf. To ask an embla, the first man and the first woman, did the gods impart divine attributes when they had but a tree life, and were of a little might and without destiny. Naked they stood before Odin at the seaway end, perceiving their conscious shame. He gave unto them divine garments, and in these they took pride. In Midgard they dwelt on the shore edge of western waters, and their children multiplied, and their children's children. The lives of mortals were long in those days. They were yet innocent, and dwelt together in peace. The golden age prevailed in Asgard, nor had the evil one of Ironwood corrupted the gods. In after days, Heimdall, son of Odin, and of the nine Vana mothers who were daughters of sea-dwelling Ran, were given from out of Galaharn a wisdom draught of Mimir's mead. Then became he a child in human guise, in a fair ring-stemmed ship was he laid, wrapped in soft slumber, and his pillow was a golden grain sheath, the gift of Frey, god of harvest. Around him were heaped great treasure war claves and full armor, weapons and tools which the god had made in Asgard. The sacred fire boar took Heimdall also with him, he who was called Stigunder, the journey maker. There came a sun bright morn when men, looking westward from Sedalan's high shore, sat drifting towards them over the blue sea, a fair ship, and on the stem shone golden rings. Night came, and it found a safe harbor and lay therein. With wonder the people beheld on the deck a man child wrapped in soft slumber. His pillow was a golden grain sheaf, and they named him Skilt of the Sheaf. Him they took unto their chief's home, and there he was nourished and fostered tenderly. The treasures that were in the ship gave great riches and power unto the tribe, and they received knowledge to grow grain and to use the sacred fire. When the child reached to wise manhood, he became a ruler among men, and long were his years. Of Heimdall have skalds sung that thrice were sons born to him of earth mothers. The first was Thrall, from whom Thralls are descended. The second was Shurl, sire of free men. And the third, Jarl, from whom all nobles have sprung. So when warriors assembled to feast together and drink mead, and ere the song was raised, have skalds spoken thus, Give ear, all ye divine races, great and small sons of Heimdall. Skilt of the sheaf achieved great renown. He who was received as a helpless child became a great and good king. He drove invaders from the shores. He scattered ravaging bands, and among the tribes he was regarded with awe. Indeed, he waxed so powerful that tribute was paid to him by the people who dwell beyond the seaway of Wales. A man-child was born to Skilt. He was named Beowulf, and when he came to years of strength and knowledge, he won fair repute. Among the followers of his sire, he distributed many money gifts, so that he won their favor. Ready were they indeed to serve him in wartime. When Skilt was of great age, he departed at his faithful hour to go into the keeping of the Lord. According to his dying request, his faithful subjects carried him down to the sea beach. There, in the small harbor, lay the ship in which, as a child, he had come over the waves. Ready to go seaward, the vessel waited him in wondrous wintry beauty, glistening with hoarfrost and ice. By the mast on the great bosom of the ship, the mourners laid down their well-beloved lord, the generous giver of golden money rings. 
great treasures they heaped around him, graven ornaments from distant lands, armor and weapons of war and bright swords, and on his breast they put many gems. As rich and numerous were the gifts they gave, as were those they had received from the child in other years. Over the dead king they hoisted a banner of gold. Then was the boat let loose. The tide bored away to the heaving ocean. Thus, in deep sadness, was the king given unto the sea, while his people sorrowed for him, watching from the shore. No man can tell who received that fair ship's burden. Beowulf then reigned over the Schildings and was honored and well-loved. His son, Halfdene, who followed him, was famed afar as a warrior, and when he waxed old, he was yet fierce in battle. Four children he had, Herogair, a captain of warmen, Hrothgar, who became King Halga the Good, and Ellen, the queen of the Swedish chieftain. Hrothgar was a strong leader, and he won many great battles. He received willing service, and under him the young war men increased in numbers until he commanded a mighty army. Then bethought he to have a great hall built, with a larger feasting room than was ever heard of among men. For that purpose were workers from many tribes put in service, and in due season was erected the high horn gabled building, which was called Herat, and he awaited the devouring flames. There was much feasting and merriment in the great hall. A fierce, man-eating monster, which dwelt in darkness, was made angry by the revelry. The music of harps, the cheerful songs of skulls. One was in the hall, too, who told how the Almighty did create man and the earth in the midst of the encircling sea, and did set the sun and the moon and the heavens to give light and cover the land with branches and leaves. Thus did Warman live happily indeed in the hall, until the hell fiend began to work evil. Grendel was his name, and he hovered by night on the marches, and he held moorland in vain. By the Creator were he and his kind banished to their dark lairs, because they were the kindred of Cain the slayer of Abel, whose evil progeny were monsters and elves and sea demons, as well as the giants who fought with God, for which he paid them with their reward. Now it happened that in the midst of the night, the demon Grendel entered the silenced hall to discover who were lodged there after beer drinking. He beheld a band of high war men who had feasted and were wrapped in deep slumber. They had forgotten sorrow, that woeful heritage of men. With fury was the demon possessed. The thirty of the war men he carried off while they slept, hastening with exulting heart to his lair with that fill of slaughter. At daybreak there was grief and loud wailing in the hall. The great and honored prince sat moodily stricken with great sorrow and gazed at the blood track of the fierce demon. His distress was long-lasting and deep. On the next night, the demon Grendel returned and did more murderous deeds. Nor had he any regret thereat, so much was he steeped in crime. Then was it easy indeed to find men who sought inner chambers by night. He alone, who found farthest retreat, escaped the fierce fiend. Then became Grendel the master indeed. For the space of twelve long winters, Hrothgar endured because of the demon's great sorrow and deep loss. Minstrels went abroad, making known and song the ceaseless outrages and the fierce strife. No offering would Grendel take, nor could the greatest war man who was seized expect to escape his doom. He entrapped young and old on the mist-dark moorlands. He seized his victims night after night. In vain did Hrothgar lament 
and make offerings unto idols, and prayed that the soul destroyer would give them release from the demon. So did the heathen, as was their custom, remember hell, for they knew not the Creator, the Judge of deeds, the Lord of God, nor could they praise the Lord of glory. Then did Beowulf, a thane among the Geats, come to hear in his fatherlands of the deeds of Grendel. In his time he was the strongest among living men, and he was noble as he was indeed mighty. Get ready, my good wave traverser, he said. I shall go unto Hrathgar over the swan way. He hath need of men. The prudent, who depended on his aid, sought not to behold Beowulf back. They urged on the stout-hearted hero, and looked eagerly for favorable omens. Beowulf selected fourteen of the finest war men to go with him, and took also a sea-skilled mariner who knew the landmarks along the path of the ocean. Then to the ship they all went together. It lay beached below a sheltering headland. The warriors, bearing their arms, walked on to the stem, while the sea waves were washed against the sand. The armor and ornaments were placed on board, and then the willing heroes pushed into deep water the strong, timbered, braced ship. Like to a bird was a swift floater, necked with white foam, driven by favorable winds over the sea waves. All night they sailed on, and the next day they beheld high and shining cliffs, steep mountains, and bold seaness. So came they to a seaway end. The voyage was over and past. The heroes leapt speedily from the ship and made it fast to the shore. Their armor clinked as they turned inland, while they thanked God that the seaway had been made easy to them. Then there came towards them the coast guardian of the Schuldings riding upon his horse along the shore. He shook his strong spear shaft as he drew nigh and he spake, saying, who are you who is high ship, have come over the seaway, well armed and bearing weapons? Know ye that I keep watch over the shore, so that the sea plunderers may not do harm to Denmark. Never have I beheld armed men landing more openly, nor know ye the password of friends. Nor ever have I beheld a greater earl than this one among you, unless his looks belie him. He is no homestayer. Noble is his heir. Ere you advance farther to spy out the land, I must know who ye are. Now listen to me. See, travelers from afar, my frank advice is that ye reveal at once from whence ye came. That shore guardian did Beowulf answer thus. We are Geats, the hearth friends of Huliark. My sire, Ejtheo, the noble leader, was renowned among the people. He was remembered by every wise man. Now know that we come seeking the, thy king, the son of Halfdana, protector of the people. Be thou our guide. A great mission is ours, nor indeed its purpose be concealed. To us hath it been told, and thou knowest of it is true, that a malignant foeman works evil by night among shouldings. I can counsel Hrothgar how the fiend may be overcome, and his miseries have end. On his horse sitting, the fearless shore guardian spake an answer, saying, A shield war man shall judge well between your words and deeds. Friendly are you, I hear, to the rule of the shouldings. Then pass onward in armor, carrying your weapons. I shall guide you. My comrades shall guard thy ship, so that the well-loved man, thy leader, may return over the sea tides to the borders of the Vader. To him it is assured that he shall come unscathed through the battle crush. Together they went on their way until they came to the high and gold-decked hall of Rothkar. The shore guardian pointed towards it and said, Now must I take my departure. May the Almighty protect you all in your adventure. To the seashore I must hasten to keep watch against hostile bands. Beowulf and his heroes reached the hall. Sea-weary they all were, and they placed their shields and armor against the wall. 
They put their spears together and rested on benches. A warrior who was Rothgar's messenger asked them whence they came. Never, said he, have I seen bolder strangers. It would seem that ye have come to seek Hrothgar, not because of exile, but because of your bravery and noble-mindedness. Then did Beowulf reveal who he was, and seek audience with the king and his messenger, did Wulfgar bear unto Hrothgar, who sat gray-headed and old among his peers. As a youth I knew Beowulf, the aged ruler said, he comes to a sure friend. Of him have I heard that his hand hath the strength of thirty men. The holy God hath sent him hither as a help against the dreaded Grindel. So he bade the messenger welcome Beowulf and his men and usher them into his presence. When Beowulf entered, he hailed Hrothgar, the kinsman of Huliart, standing behind him in their shining armor. In, in my youth, he said, I have undertaken great exploits. In my fatherland heard I the evil deeds of Grendel, and my people counseled me, knowing my great strength, that I should come hither. For they know well that I avenged the sorrows of the Vaders, bound five of their foes, slew a brood of giants, and killed sea monsters by night. Alone shall I go now against this demon, this giant Grendel. Then asked Beowulf as a boon that he alone with his warriors should be left to cleanse the hall of the monster. Having heard that Grendel had no fear of weapons, he also made known his desire to contend with him unarmed. With the friend, he said, I shall wrestle for life foe against foe. Rothgar, <clears throat> Rothgar accepted Beowulf's offer with gladness and granted him the boon he sought. Then was a bench cleared for the noble heroes. They sat there in pride and drank of bright liquor. Songs were sung by a clear-voiced minstrel. There was much joy in the hall among the Danes and the Vaders, who was no small company. When they had feasted and the queen bore the cup round the heroes, young and old, she greeted Beowulf, who was by then very drunk, said he had vowed to say Grendel or perish in his clutches. The old queen was much pleased to hear the words which the great hero spake. Loud revelry was heard in the hall once more until Rothgar desired to go to his couch. Well, he knew that the night-haunting monster would attack the hall when the sun's radiance was dimmed and shadows fell and dusky shapes were stalking under the clouds. Then the whole company arose and greeted the heroes. Hrothgar greeted Beowulf and wished him success and power in the hall. Be mindful of thy renown, the king said. Make known thy great might. Be watchful against the foe. Thou shalt lack naught that thou desire if thou shalt survive this conflict. Whereupon Hrothgar went forth with all his warriors, leaving the hall to Beowulf and his men. When he thus left alone with his heroes, the chief of the Geats took off his armor and gave his decorated sword to this thane. Ere he lay down in bed, he said, No less in fighting strength than Grendel do I account myself. I shall not slay him with my sword as I well might. He knows not the noble art to strike back, splitting my shield, although he hath strength and courage in evil doing. No weapons shall we use if he dares combat without them. May the wise God, the holy Lord, give victory to the side which may seem meet to him. On his pillow, Beowulf then laid his head, Around him on beds lay his warriors, nor did one of them expect ever again to return to his home. 
for each of them had heard how in times past the Danish warriors were taken from the hall in bloody death. In the blackness of night, Grendel, the shadow goer, came striding towards the hall. The warriors, sea weary and spent, lay wrapped in deep slumber, nor kept watch all save one. He alone was defiantly awake, awaiting the issue of the conflict with increasing wrath. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.